Hello, my name is Nicole, and thank you so much for tuning in today. I just want to say that I appreciate everyone who has stopped at my various blogs, my YouTube page, and a number of other places. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to get into numbers 30. Numbers 30, I'm reading out of the New International Version Bible. And we're going to talk about vowels. We're going to talk about vowels. You see, there's a lot of people who like to say, oh, God, you know, that Old Testament, eh, that's old news. I mean, uh, Jesus came. So, you know, we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, all of what, you know, is going on in that Old Testament. But, oh, we do need to be concerned because God hasn't changed. Sure, Jesus came down and he did many things on this planet and then went back up into heaven but left the Holy Ghost behind. But God, his father, has not changed. Oh, sure, society has changed. We have new developments and, you know, new attitudes and so forth. But the foundation of who God is to us and what he expects from us has not changed. We still have vows that we take, promises that we make, contracts and so forth that we sign. The premise of vow taking, making promises and so forth has not changed. People expect you to keep your word. And today, this is what this message is about. It's about us keeping our word. Not only with people, but with God. With God. So let us begin. Numbers 30, verse 1. Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel, This is what the Lord commands. Now let me stop right there. This is what the Lord commands. Some of you all have gotten messages. And you know those messages have come directly from the Lord. The Lord has commanded you to do something. Okay? Why would he feel the need to command you to do something well because you reached out to him right you prayed certain prayers you wanted him to do certain things in your life and so a relationship with God works both ways it's not just you putting out your request to him making promises and all this other stuff but it's also God talking to you giving you promises as well instructing you on various things I tell people there's no sense in praying and acknowledging God and saying that you're all about God's business and all of that and standing before congregations and talking and all that if when the word comes back to you from God himself you're not willing to listen okay so Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel so evidently he had a relationship with God some people are spouting off all sorts of things on the internet off the internet and they don't have a, re a true relationship with the Lord they got a relationship with their mama's God with their daddy's God with so-and-so's God and what they heard about and what they read about and what video they watched or television show but do they really really have a personal relationship with God that Moses type of relationship you see Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel he couldn't say anything unless he had a relationship with the Lord, especially this phrase. This is what the Lord commands in verse two. When a man makes a vow to the Lord, some of you all, you prayed those prayers. I promise God I'm going to do this. Or you stood before men and women and you put your hand on a Bible or you said that you were going to do this under the eyes of God. And, and so you promised and on and on, right? Verse 2, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge. And some people do that in some of these fraternal groups. But what they don't realize is that the God that is presiding over those various groups are not necessarily the God that they think. Lord Jesus, I'm stepping on some toes, but oh well. God spoke. He showed many, many individuals. Used his messengers to tell people. That those are ancient gods. Those are gods that God himself warned about from many, many centuries ago. And you still making pledges. You, those statues and all those other little symbols and so forth. Those are the types of things that showed up in idolatry. Uh-oh. But some people continue to obligate themselves under those particular gods. Lord Jesus. 
So anyway, let's read it in its full context. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word. Uh-oh, that's why some people won't break free from some of these fraternal groups and civic organizations and nonprofit associations because of the pledge they made. So they'll take a scripture like this and run with it and say, well, I made a pledge, so that's why I got to stay. Even when God told them no. He must not break his word, but must do everything he said. Right? So, you want to sign up with a group that you know is dishonest, has a history of lying, stealing from people. Oh, you got to be careful some of these jobs you get connected with. Because when you make that pledge... You're going to obligate yourself to that organization. You're going to tell yourself every day so that it makes you feel better about sin. Well, I can't break my word. No, uh-uh. I got to do everything that the book says, that the leader said, that my brother said, that my sister said. Well, what does God say? You see, did you make a pledge with God that you were going to do what was right? Let's read on verse 3. When a young woman still living in her father's household makes a vow to the Lord or obligates herself by a pledge, right? And her father hears about her vow or pledge but says nothing, right? Says nothing to her. Then all her vows and every pledge by which she obligated herself will stand. You see, some individuals around you, they're not saying anything because God's not allowing it because guess what? It's your vow. It's your pledge. They don't want to be a part of that. They know that you're obligating yourself to that. Now, if they open their mouth, they might feel that they're going to obligate themselves to whatever it is that you promised or said you were going to do. So when you get upset because nobody's saying anything, God may be in that. And then again, God may not be. So you got to reevaluate that pledge, that vow. Is it in alignment with scripture? Is it something that you're content with, you're at peace with? Lord Jesus, I'm talking to some of you all because you make these vows and pledges. You sign contracts. You say you're going to pay this. You're going to do that. You're going to be committed to this one and that one and so on and so forth. And then you look around and say, but nobody said anything or come on, give me something. Well, that's your obligation. Not everybody is going to say something. God's not going to move everybody to say something. It's your trial period. It's your test. You're supposed to use the knowledge, your past experiences, some life application, right? Taking these scriptures and applying them to your life to see whether or not what you have vowed or pledged is in fact what God has ordained. Or was it men who encouraged you to do what you're doing right now? Or women? Or I just read something one day and happened to turn on the, turn the page and so I just kind of stumbled on it. Or I took a test one day and that's how I fell into it. Or I just looked at my child and, you know, well, I mean, maybe God used my child to say it. So I just went on and I did this. Come on now. You've got to look at why you are obligating yourself to certain things. Verse 5, but if her father forbids her when he hears about it, oh Lord Jesus, none of her vows or the pledges by which she obligated herself will stand. The Lord will release her because her father has forbidden her. I'm going to go there with father and daughter relationships. Sometimes fathers will speak up and sometimes they won't. In this particular case, this is an if situation. You see, but if her father forbids, now if the father didn't say anything about it, she obligated herself. But if her father has said something about it, then she is going to listen or she might consider. Don't necessarily mean she's going to do what her father says. But I love this part where it says, the Lord will release her because her father has forbidden her. You see. 
That's freedom right there. Let's read that again. But if her father forbids her when he hears about it, none of her vows or the pledges by which she obligated herself will stand. You see, the father can be used by God to tell his daughter that this is not a good idea. You see, God can use a mother, can use a best friend, can use even a stranger on the street too. It's not a good idea. But in this case, we're looking at the father because this father's word holds significance. This father is in an order, a structure in a household where he's the head. You see, and he is protecting his daughter. He's forbidding something to take place. Why? Why? There could be many reasons. So she may have promised certain things. She may have pledged certain things. She may have even went to God and said, God, well, you know, this is what I think and this is what I should do and what have you. But then she changed her mind or something happened. So then what? The Lord will release her because her father has forbidden her from the start. It wasn't a good idea, but the girl obligated herself and then she changed her mind. And so then the Lord will release her. See, unlike man, man's not going to release you. Man's going to hold you against or hold you to certain things. He's going to be against you. He's going to say all sorts of negativity. He's going to try to belittle you and tell you that your decision was stupid. And I knew you shouldn't have done it. And no, I'm not going to help you. And if you would have just listened to me. But you see here, the scripture says the Lord will release you see, and some of you fathers need to release your daughters. You need to release them from their faulty decision making. From some negative things that they did. Release them. There's no sense in holding these things against them. Now in verse 6 it says, if she marries, uh oh, now we're going to get into some personal stuff. Right. If she marries after she makes a vow or after her lips utter a rash promise by which she obligates herself. Didn't say obligated to family and oh, wow, you burdening me and all this. Da, 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 da. No, it said she obligates herself and her husband hears about it, but says nothing to her. Then her vows or the pledges by which she obligated herself will stand. You see, he didn't say anything. He didn't have an issue with her. He didn't say, you got to go away. You got to get out. You, I don't want you. Um, here's your certificate of divorce and so on and so forth. He didn't say anything. So she has still obligated herself and the things that she said stands. We can take this same uh, perspective and apply it to a job situation even. See, your boss hasn't said anything to you about firing you or getting rid of you or anything like that. So your allegiance to that company still stands. The day, though, that your boss says, I don't want you, get out or what have you, then, you know, you're fired, that sort of thing. Well, then, of course, your pledge to that organization is no more, right? Well, the same thing could apply in your marriage, if you will, to the Lord, your relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, you may have uttered a rash promise when you said, oh, Lord, I promise I will do this, that, and the other for you. And I vow that I will be this, that, and the other. And then what happened? Some people come along and they said some things that knocked you off track or you did some things that you know you shouldn't have. Well, God himself speaks to you and says you're not doing what's right or what have you. You're free. You don't have to be obligated to this church. You don't have to walk with me. I know you weren't genuine from the beginning, you see. And some people, they'll take their freedom. Yeah, it's too much. You know, some will even go so far as to become atheists and say, I don't even believe in a God. I may have at one time, but not anymore, you see. God is not going to hold you down. He's not going to beat you over the head. He's just going to show you the error of your ways and it's up to you to fix them. 
But let's read on. In verse 8, but if her husband forbids her when he hears about it, he nullifies the vow that obligates her or the rash promise by which she obligates herself and the Lord will release her. Her husband doesn't agree with what's going on. He doesn't want her, let's say, to go to work or he doesn't want her to be around certain individuals. He speaks up about various things that could be a detriment to the marriage. You see. Oh, well, it's a little bit too much for some women. They can't stay in a relationship. It's too many do's and don'ts and this and that and the other. The Lord will release her. Some of us no, you got to stick it out. You got to do this and that. We don't know what his mental issue is, that man. We don't know. Let's not be so quick to push people. To tell him, you better stay, you better stay. And just do what your husband says. You don't know what he's doing and saying behind closed doors. Oh, he may be shaking your hand. He may look good in your sight. And for some women, they may even want that man. But you don't know what, what he has said to her. You don't know what the rules of the relationship are. No, you may be free. You may be allowed to do certain things. And it's no drama in your household. But you don't know what she has to go through. You see, so we got to be real quick. Or I should say, not real quick. <laughs> Let me change that. But we've got to be slow in saying things about, well, she should and he could. And why don't they? You see. Oh, but if it comes to a point where she has had enough and she can't handle this vow that she took, oh, then God will release her, especially if the man is speaking up and saying he doesn't want her anymore anyway, you see. In verse 9, any vow or obligation, here we go, taken by a widow, right, or a divorced woman will be binding on her. Some widows... They obligate themselves to all sorts of things, even long after their husbands have died. It's binding. Some divorced women have signed contracts and done certain things long after the marriage has come to an end. It's binding. You got to go to God. For some of you all, you got to go to God and ask for release, for, re for release, for release. Somebody spoke out, spoke up, spoke on your behalf against something, someone. And all you need now is a release, Lord Jesus. Free those that are bound to old contracts, Lord Jesus. In verse 10, if a woman living with her husband makes a vow, uh oh, she's living with her husband, notice, not separated from, not living in another place, but if a woman living with her husband makes a vow or obligates herself by a pledge under oath and her husband hears about it but says nothing to her and does not forbid her, right, then all her vows or the pledges by which she obligated herself will stand. You see, oh yes, this is Old Testament. But it has a New Testament spin on it, doesn't it? It has some life application to it, doesn't it? As I bring it to you in this way. Because like I said, the God that I serve, he hasn't changed. He still, he still honors pledges. He still listens to vows. Oh, some of you all that were so quick, so quick to make, you know, a promise to the Lord. Take heed, take heed to what he's saying to you today. Let's go back into this relationship again in verse 10. If a woman living with her husband makes a vow, some of you all, listen closely. You're in these relationships. You got married, right? You made a vow or obligated yourself by pledge under oath. And if your husband heard about it but said nothing to you and does not forbid you, then all your vows or the pledges by which you obligated yourself will stand. He didn't say nothing about your job. He didn't say nothing about the little organization you got yourself involved in. He didn't say anything about the new friendships and the networking and so forth. He's not giving you any heartache about it. So don't look for the fight. Don't look for the fight. 
Don't talk yourself out of things that you know that you really should be doing and you know that God has ordained you to do. Don't use him to speak out against it so that you aren't bound to it or you're released from it. And, you know, trying to take God's words and benefit somehow. Twist them around. You see, don't do that. Don't do that. In verse 12, but if her husband nullifies them when he hears about them, okay, that is, of course, if you wasn't manipulating him to nullify them, some of you, not all, but if her husband nullifies them when he hears about them, then none of the vows or pledges that came from her lips will stand. Her husband has nullified them and the Lord will release her. Oh, honey, I promised that I was going to do this and that. And, you know, I just, and I, okay, well, honey, you know what? You don't have to do this, that, and the other. And then he may even go so far as to pray for his wife who is under so much stress. And then the next thing you know, she doesn't feel burdened anymore because he's going to take on that responsibility or he's going to help her out. You know, whatever the case may be. You see, some people are agonizing quietly because they done obligated themselves to so many things and they feel like they need to, you know, keep it all in. And I don't want to discuss it because my husband might do this, that, and the other. Well, your husband is supposed to be your helpmate just like you're to be his. So you might want to share some things. Those of you all who are in these types of relationships. Now, those of you all who are boyfriend and girlfriend, uh, uh, that situation is totally different. Okay, we're talking about covenant marriages, you know, those types of things. Okay. And they're different because, because I can hear somebody now saying, well, what's so different about it? I mean, I'm committed. No, there's a different, there's a different status with those that are wife and husband versus those that are girlfriend and boyfriend. The commitment has not been made before the eyes of men and women you know it's just been some stuff behind closed doors until you come up out of that room where you made the promises and so forth with that man girlfriend or boyfriend okay who what have you let's not you know look at this situation applying to girlfriends and boyfriends okay now, in verse 13, her husband may confirm or nullify any vows she makes or in any sworn pledge to deny herself. But, in verse 14, if her husband says nothing to her about it from day to day, then he confirms all her vows or the pledges binding on her. He confirms them by saying nothing to her when he hears about them. Now, this can be dangerous because... What if she obligated herself to something that is a detriment to the marriage? What if she got herself involved in all sorts of craziness? Uh-oh. You might want to speak up. You might want to say something. So that all this craziness will stop in Jesus' name. The same thing goes with, you know, the wife who sees her husband obligated with all sorts of things. You might want to speak up and say something. Verse 15, if however he nullifies them sometime after he hears about them, then he must bear the consequences of her wrongdoing. You see, God is working on the heads of these households as well as in the church, saints. Because, you see, a husband is going to bear the consequences when his wife is stepping out of line and doing some things she's not supposed to. And it's going to affect everybody in that household. And the same thing goes on in the church. If the minister does not have his priorities straight and he is allowing all sorts of things to take place and the wife is doing what she wants to do and he's not saying anything, even when she's in the wrong, he's going to bear the consequences of her wrongdoing. The bride being the church or the bride being his wife, you see. God says we're to cast his, cast our burdens onto him, right? So we cast all those burdens onto him. He's bearing those consequences, aren't, isn't he? But he has the power. He has the strength. He can be able to take on all of that. But us, us frail human beings in mind, body, and spirit, we can't take on all of the drama that's going on personally and professionally. You need some help. Lord Jesus, somebody out there needs some help. Pray the kind of prayers that are going to release you from some of these vows and pledges and so forth that you've made. 
Make your life easier, says the Lord. Don't be stubborn. Do what's right. Spend the needed time with God. Before all other things. Oh, God knows you need a job. God knows you need a place to stay. God knows that you need to get up out of your situation. God knows. But put him first. Each and every day. Make sure that you got enough wisdom and knowledge and strength and what have you. To get through that day. Maybe even through that hour. But spend the necessary time with God to hear something. To be guided somewhere. God, Lord, Lord, please guide my feet. I need some help. Some of you all, you want a free gift or something. So you go and you sign off on something. You make a pledge that you're going to pay this and that and the other and then you can't pay it. Some people get swindled into things, manipulated. And God is saying, well, don't keep being manipulated. Don't keep believing the lies. Come to me. I can free you from these things. Listen to the messengers all around you. Those that are of me. Don't fight them when they're giving you truth. When they're trying to save you money. When they're trying to save you from having to go to court. Or save you from some future disappointment. Pledging to certain jobs. Pledging to certain groups. Taking these vows, knowing full well you don't really want to be a part of these groups and associations and so forth, but you're just doing it in the meantime. What does God say in Jesus' name? Men going out with women, then telling them that they're going to do this, that, and the other, and then they don't even do one, maybe even two things of the list. Some men still working on lists from years ago. They promised to do certain things and didn't do them. And God's holding them to those promises. Maybe she isn't. Maybe he isn't holding the woman to those promises. But God, God is. You said you were going to do this, that, and the other. And you never did it. Men promising, I'm going to buy you this. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to do this, that, and the other. And then what happens? They don't fulfill their obligation. So now God sets it up. We're now... That woman's going to make some things happen since that man didn't. And your relationship is going to suffer behind it. I can promise you when a woman ends up coming up out of her role to be in a position to fulfill a promise that was made to her by a man who was supposed to be doing this, that, and the other. It's going to be some drama up in your house. It's better that that man go ahead and take that pledge, that vow back and say, oh, I do recall when I told you I was going to do this and that and the other. And so therefore I'm going to do it. In verse 16, these are the regulations the Lord gave Moses concerning what relationships between a man and his wife and between a father and his young daughter still living at home. But as you can see, I broke the scripture down in such a way where this can apply to other areas of our lives the precepts if not literally of course but at least the precepts because some of you all may not be married but you can take something like this and use it use it for what's going on in your partnerships and relationships with you know employees and so on and so forth but I don't advise that some who are not in committed relationships and are not even thinking about marriage to try to take something like this and apply it because it can actually work against you. And how do I know? Because I've been there and done that. I've tried to take what was meant for married man and woman and apply it to relationships in the past that were not like that. And they only got worse as a result. It isn't until you get married, which praise God I am now, that you will see the light and you'll say, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. I took this vow. I said this. I did this. I made this promise and so on and so forth. And so therefore, I'm obligated to do this, that, and the other. But if I can no longer handle it or it becomes a burden to me or the person around me is speaking up about it, then Hey, I consider that my release, praise God. I can't handle it. I'm seeking out the support system. I'm asking for the help, you see. 
there's so many young girls and and uh, adult women at home with their fathers and their fathers are trying to protect them from the wolf in sheep's clothing out there but they want to fight their dad and say their dad is old school and you don't understand and all this other stuff and so then the next thing you know you end up making a pledge or vow to a man who ends up being abusive who ends up being a cheat who ends up lying stealing and conniving one that's a narcissist type or has a bipolar issue or any social or whatever the case may be and now you've taken those issues that your father was trying to explain to you to stay away from and he's no good and I don't approve and now you have taken those on and now you don't you can't understand why your relationship isn't working out and why you are feeling the way you feel every time this guy's around and oh he used to be this that and the other but now he's not and your father sitting there saying I told you early on I could see the writing on the wall you see but oh the rebellious daughter the daughter who thinks she knows so much she's not going to listen she's going to keep on doing what she wants to do until one day something really really bad happens oh I can speak some of you all got laboring to love and abusive mates so you know what I mean Lord Jesus so I hope that Numbers 30 was a wake-up call to some of you all who like to make promises. Whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, or even if you're a child talking to parents saying, Ma, I promise I'm going to get this done. Dad, I promise I'm going to get this done. Understand the precepts. Know that God is one who takes vows and pledges seriously. And if you know that you're not one for doing what you are supposed to do then it is best in Jesus name not to even make a promise so I thank you as always for listening let us do take this time out to pray thank you Lord for just guiding this listener to this audio I pray in Jesus name I sincerely pray in Jesus name that this li listener who has obligated his or herself to a marriage or a, a business partnership or a job or a friendship even that they will be released if it is not something that is of you that they will learn from their situation and that they will do better next time I ask that you will protect them from all harm and danger I ask that you will give them the courage to go through whatever battle is coming as a result of their vow or pledge and I pray in Jesus name that their situation will draw them closer to you I pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you, and thank you again, Lord Jesus. And thank you, listener, for stopping by today. To God be the glory.